what makes somebody a good leader? In our culture, we typically look at leaders, uh, we, we typically view good leaders as those who excel at getting things done. They have a lot of followers. They express themselves well, are able to influence others and cash vision to accomplish important tasks. Le- good leaders are intelligent, understanding the steps that need to be taken and bold, being willing to follow through on hard decisions. Good leaders today are often rewarded by blue checks after their names on social media accounts. They're on TV, they're speaking at conferences, writing books and blogs, and generally viewed as successful by others. Um, and I'm just speaking societally. Um, essentially, you put people we view as good leaders on pedestals and allow them to speak with authority into our lives. But there's a big difference between successful leaders and good leaders. A successful leader may do all the things that I just mentioned, but good leaders often fly under the radar. There's several that you probably know of in your life. A teacher who took a personal interest in helping you to learn material in the class. The coach that believed in you and helped you to grow and investing in you. Uh, Maybe as a parent, aunt, uncle, sibling, or a a good friend that went out of their way to help you, took a personal interest in your growth and development. And knowing who the good leaders are is extremely important. One of the most important things in life. Knowing who we can trust ourselves and our families to. Knowing who we can or should follow. It's especially important to have good leadership in the church. You're probably here right now because at some point in the time you had a good leader in the church that helped you grow in your faith with with Jesus. And we've all uh, seen our share of bad leaders as well. It's always devastating to see bad leaders at any level, but especially in the church, those that represent God, uh, to be acting in a bad way. So how can we know the difference between a good leader and a bad leader? We have to know what good church leaders look like, and that's not always easy. Even defining leadership is not a simple task. By definition, a leader has followers. Uh, And so in in an area that makes you a leader to some capacity. So it's easy, uh, the the simplest way to define leadership is just influence. If you influence someone to act a certain way, you're you're being a leader in that way. So all of us are leaders, whether or not we have an official title, whether or not we realize it, we are all leaders to some degree. And we're all called to, to leadership in the church. So the question is, what kind of leaders are we going to be? We need to have an image of good, godly leadership burned into our minds. It's critically important. Good leadership, we need to know what a good leader is, so when we subject ourselves to teaching or authority of somebody else, we're following someone who can be trusted and someone who's good. And also, as we seek to grow in our own leadership, we want to to have a model of what we need to be aiming for. No matter what age or gender or whatever you are, uh, we need to become good leaders. Now, now Paul is speaking uh, to Titus. He's talking specifically to... um, church leadership, and he gives a, a clear description of what, of what good, godly leaders look like to his protege, Tim, uh, Titus, in, chap- in Titus chapter 1, 5 to 9. So if you have your Bible, please feel free to turn with me. Uh, Titus 1, verses 5 to 9. Uh, Paul gives 17 qualifiers for good leadership that he names. It's a lot, but I'm really excited to be able to simplify that for you and, and the acronym LEAD. And so we can, we can use these categories to grow our leadership and evaluate the, the leadership of others. Uh, Titus is a, a book that was written by the Apostle Paul around 63 AD uh, to build authentic Christian community through godly leadership and good deeds in the churches in Crete. Good leaders are essential in encouraging good deeds and building the church, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And so as we look at leadership, first we need to examine the labor of leadership. The labor of leadership. And in uh, Titus 1, verse 5, Paul, s- Paul starts off by saying, the reason I left you in Crete. Now just pause for a moment here. That sounds kind of mean, doesn't it? I left you in Crete. You know, today, uh, just to call someone a Cretan is a major insult. And so Cretans had terrible reputations uh, they worshipped the god Zeus. Zeus was 
uh, full of mischief. He was a liar. He was a very, very bad person. And so there's all kinds of misfits and liars and horrible leadership in Crete. And here, what is Paul doing leaving Titus in this place of terrible people full of Cretans? Well, there's an important purpose here. Um, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So we can learn some really important things about leadership from Titus. First we see he's bringing order into chaos. He's bringing order into chaos. Uh, Paul tells him uh, to set things right. And so here he's bringing clarity into confusion. Uh, and, and he's got a purpose and a plan. You've got all these churches that don't have leaders in them, and he's bringing order into the churches in Crete. He's completing tasks that there was unfinished business that God had on the island of Crete and with the churches in Crete. And, and, and so in this letter, we see some of the things that, that Paul tells Titus to complete. The very first thing is good, good leaders in place. That's not been done get good leadership in these churches. Um, But next, we're gonna see next week, stand up to evil opposition and then advance proper conduct among Christians. Teach them to stop the hypocrisy and to follow the Lord, to live with love and obedience to the commands of Christ. And so complete the tasks, but he does this through delegation. Now, so often we look at good leaders and we focus on that individual. And and yeah, that's, that's good, uh, but really good leadership, and important leadership, is delegation. And so he's delegating, he, he's, he's uh, delegating the responsibility of leading all the churches of Crete to other qualified men. And Titus needed to assemble a team to look after the church in Crete. It took a team. But he's also following Paul's orders. He's, he's doing this just as Paul directed him to do. And so Paul, as an apostle, took orders directly from Jesus, and Paul gave orders to Titus, and Titus, as a leader, is following instructions of his superior officer. And again, thinking about the island of of Crete, if we just read between the lines here, you had to be pretty fearless and courageous to establish all these churches among all the Cretans. Go into this wild culture full of ungodly people find a handful of godly individuals that want to follow God's word and, and convince them to stand up and lead and to sacrifice and, and then to be a light in a very dark culture. It would have taken a lot of courage, um, a lot of intestinal fortitude to, to follow through on this. It's one of the most difficult missionary assignments ever given in the history of humanity. So it's pretty big. And as you think about why is Titus doing this, why would you do all these things? Well, it's servant leadership. Leadership is never for the benefit of the leader. Leadership is for the benefit of those you're leading. It's a servant position. As Jesus Christ said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so leadership is a position of service. And so here Titus was acting out of service, taking a great personal sacrifice and inconvenience. He was serving Paul, he was serving Christ, and he was serving the people and the churches in Crete. And the only legitimate form of leadership is servant leadership. And so as we translate that directly from what Titus, his leadership was, uh, well, what about today? What about church labor? Well, it's really important uh, that we we bring order to chaos. Uh, that it's one thing to say we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are, but some of us need to take different roles. Uh, there, there, we need leadership to help bring order into the church. Uh, without leadership, we'd just all be talking at once. There'd be no clear direction. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 talks about just how important it is to have order in the church. We need to clear up confusion on the messaging. We need to bring peace, unity, and harmony to the body so we're working together, all going in the same direction. I use the picture of, uh, of rowing up here on the screen. Have you ever thought about how unfair it is uh, for the coxswain? You know what the coxswain is, the person yelling at the people? That just seems so unfair, isn't it? All these other people, they're, they're breaking their backs, they're rowing hard, they're rowing in order, they're doing whatever they're told, and you've got the coxswain just sitting there barking out orders. That just, that's not fair, is it? No one's agreeing with me? It's not fair? 
Okay, getting a few chuckles. You get that, right? You get that. And yet the coxswain, and the leadership is critically important, not just for calling out the, 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 the order of, of when you row, but, but coordinating the power and the rhythm of the rowers and also guiding and, and directing the ship. And so it's easy to get mad at the leader, the coxswain, for, for not rowing is an easy target, but without the coxswain, there'd be complete chaos. And so this is a good picture of what the church should be like, of constantly calling out scripture. We need to be doing this. We need to follow this, obey in this area, press on for the gospel. And so it's important that we bring order to chaos. Leaders do that. We also need to follow orders. We are all accountable to somebody. Uh, good leaders have humility and awareness to follow orders and know who they're accountable to. Those in authority must respect the authority over them. And church leaders are responsible to God's word, accountable to God's word, the Holy Spirit, and one another. And, in the, and here in our church, we're an evangelical free church of America. I love this denomination, um, and we're responsible to the denomination to make sure that we're not out of line in what we're teaching, what we're preaching, and what we're doing. And it's actually very empowering to know that we aren't just running off on our own, that we're acting under authority of others. It's important to follow orders and to learn how to do that, to become a good leader. The task that we're faking, facing is great. Make disciples of all people in Ocala and in Florida, in the United States, and the world. It's an impossible mission. But we're, we are to accomplish this task with everyone that the Lord gives us influence to. Important tasks in front of us. We can disciple one person at a time. Evangelize, baptize, teach, lead, train one another to become disciples of Christ. A disciple, as we talked about last week, is somebody who pursues Christ, who pursues commission, who pursues community, and pursues the Great Commission. And we do that together. We're not just here to have fun. We have an important task in front of us. And it's good to have fun too, though. We must delegate. This is absolutely a team effort. It's way too big for one leader. Leaders delegate responsibility. Ephesians 4.12 is my ministry philosophy in, in one verse. It's that God's given leaders to equip the people for works of service. And so in the picture of the rower here, the, a good leader is that coxswain, somebody who doesn't do all the work, but who gets other people rowing in the right direction. And so we need to be equipping the people for works of service. That's what church leadership is about. And church leadership is difficult. And much courage is required. We are not a Cretan culture, but I'm not sure how far off of Cretan culture we are. We have to do the right thing regardless of the criticism, regardless of the cost. And you could say that you've, we've never had more distractions in the history of humanity than we do right now. Think about that. There's never been more distractions in the history of mankind than we do right now. Right? All you have to do is pull out your phone, and there's a whole world of distraction right there. And so to stay focused on what matters most, to keep our eyes and our presence in reality, what's in front of us, it's really, it's really hard. We've got to be courageous to call people to action. We've also ne never had more luxuries or longer lives in the modern era. You have to keep calling us back to Scripture, back to God, and obedience to His commands there. So we, it does take a lot of courage to lead in this day and age. And we must take the example of Christ. Again, Mark 10, 45. And Jesus Himself did not come to be served, but He came to serve. He came to lay His life down for us that we might have life. We must be constantly serving one another and the wonderful example of Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, when he took the bread, and that was, it was after he uh, had washed the feet of all of his disciples. Why is the king of all the universe washing the feet of his disciples? Dirty, gross feet, full of dust. Why would Jesus serve in such a compelling manner? That's a set example for us and the kind of leadership we need to have, the servant leadership. Do you feel like a leader this morning? Do you feel like a leader this morning? Maybe the answer is yes. I have an official title. And yes, there are some people with official titles here. Title of elder or deacon or Sunday school leader or, or whatever it may be. And so, yes, good for you. You've earned that title. Your service is much appreciated. Thank you. 
Maybe you don't feel like a leader because you don't have a title. Does that make you not a leader? Does that remove the influence from you? No, it doesn't. Maybe you, you say, yes, I feel like a leader. I have influence, and I know I have influence. You recognize that your attitudes, your words, and your actions impact others. So glad that you're self-aware. You know, we have so many unofficial roles. You know, the matriarchs, the patriarchs, you know, the aunt that everyone listens to, or whoever it is, or the friend. Uh, yes, uh, we have a lot of those in here that uh, just you know that you influence other people. Maybe you don't feel like you're a leader because of your personality. I'm not saying you've got no personality. <laughs> but this introverted personality, you don't feel like somebody who's comfortable getting in front of teaching in front of people and that you have more of a shy or withdrawn personality. Um, and, and you're more, but maybe you're just more of a leadership behind, leader behind the scenes. Uh, maybe you don't feel like a leader because you've been criticized in your past you tried to do something and you, everyone jumped on your back and you got hurt. Leadership is service and leadership is hard and anytime you do something and take a step and try to accomplish something, there's going to be criticism. There's going to be opposition, especially in the spiritual realm because spiritual warfare is real and Satan does not appreciate it when we step out and try to obey the Lord. And so when we step out and try to lead, criticism is just going to come. Maybe you don't fit the leader because of self-criticism. Because you look in your past, you think, well, how can God use me to, to lead? How can I be a leader? I've really messed up in the past. And so you may feel like a leader, you may not feel like a leader, but it's important to know that at least on an unofficial level, every single person that walked in this morning, you are a leader to some degree. And, and, and even those we might not know as well as others, um, the way you impact the what you do impacts other people. It's important to know that. Leadership is a labor of love. It is a sacred opportunity to serve others, influencing them to stand firm in the faith as we love one another and spur each other on to love and good deeds. And leadership is hard work. It's often, you might have heard the phrase, leadership is loneliness. It could be very difficult but we must press on walking the narrow path, inviting our friends, family, neighbors, community, and the world to join us as we follow Christ. And now we look into the example of leadership. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. As we, as we move into this, Paul is, is talking about a specific leadership within the church. He uses two words for this interchangeably, elder and overseer. And so first we'll look at elder. Elder is talking about the person, the leader himself. You know what elder means, literally? What elder means, literally. Etymology is from a Latin term. It means old man. And so I don't, I don't think I'd be, I don't think I'd be stepping out and taking risks here by saying we got some elders here this morning. And so many in here qualify. But actually, if you think about it, this is where things get, things get really interesting. Do you know what the life expectancy was of someone in the first century Roman Empire? For every person that was born, Okay, 22 to 33 years, depending upon what area of the world you're born in. Uh, now, uh, about a quarter of those were infant deaths. You factor out infant and child mortality, just the average person, if you made it into, if you made it past the age of five, the life expectancy was around 40 to 45. Isn't that amazing? We're about twice that. That is absolutely mind-blowing to think about the day that we're in. And so a better way, instead of old, old man or old person, a better way is mature character. Much better to look at it as mature character. We all know people who don't act their age, either in a good way or a bad way. Mature beyond years. We have many students in here that I'm so proud of you guys and, and young adults. You're acting like 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds. It's wonderful. Mature beyond your years. An elder is somebody 
of mature character, somebody who has lived and learned enough in life to know the pathways and to help others traverse difficult terrain. And so I'll use this picture, somebody who knows the, knows the pathways, knows the routes, and can help others traverse difficult terrain together. The second term that's used is overseer. Overseer could be translated as steward or manager. This is not about personality. We collectively belong to the Lord, that, we are, that leaders are stewards. The church leaders are stewards of God's people. It's critically important. A steward is we, we have charge over something that does not belong to us. And so we are responsible directly to God for how we interact with and love the church that we're part of. And so leaders, specifically elders in the church, or stewards or managers, must be very discerning on who we put in leadership. The first thing right off the bat is the elders should be blameless. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? It sounds pretty amazing to be blameless. Uh, literally b- beyond reproach. <laughs> reproach isn't a term we use very often either. Essentially, it's meaning that we're not condemned by our behavior. We don't bring disapproval. We don't bring a, a bad name upon Christ or the church. People see what we're doing in here. They see, what it, they see that it's good. We're helping others. We, we love, we care. We're not acting out of selfishness. It does not mean faultless. It it's kind of feels weird to say that. Blameless does not equal faultless. Because we've all messed up. There's no perfect person in here. We're forgiven, not faultless. This is the first of 17 qualifications for an elder in the church. I'm going to summarize it so it's going to make sense, I hope. Firstly, we talk about the, the family life of an elder. The, the words here in the NIV are, are faithful to his wife, literally a one-woman man. Uh, there's different ways to interpret that. My interpretation is you're only married to one woman at a time. Only married to one woman at a time. No other interests on the side. But even taking it a little, a little beyond that, and it's important also to mention divorce. If, if there's been divorce or heartaches in the past, that's in the past. God's concerned about the present. That you are right now committed to one woman. Uh, for women leadership in the church are committed to one man. That if you're married, you're devoted, showing fidelity to your spouse. But it's important to take a step further here. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew uh, chapter 5. That anyone who looks at someone else lustfully has committed adultery in their heart. And so it's not enough to simply say, you're a man with only one wife, but a man who is faithful to your wife in every way, even when people aren't looking. The second thing is is to have believing children. Believing children. Believing in what? Well, believing in the message of Christ. The message of the gospel. Uh, John 3.16 simply put that God so loved us that he sent his son Jesus to die for us, to pay for our sins, because none of us are worthy to stand before God as we are. And so God loved us so much, he sent Jesus to die for us. And all who put our faith and trust in him are forgiven. And we have eternal life. And we do not get what we deserve. And so that our children believe that and understand that. And so the, the, primary, the primary goal of leadership is, is proclaiming that message and helping us to understand what that means. And to loving one another and walking as Christ walked. And if you want to know if if a man is a good leader, well, look at his home. Do his children believe? Think about all the time that we have with our children. And if if a man spends that much time in his family and his children don't believe, you do not want that person in charge of your children or leading the entire church as a whole. It's not meant to be a legalistic issue. Uh, Some parents become Christians later in life and their children don't believe. Uh, Some people raise their their children up in church, but then they leave, they wander from from the church later. Uh, But overall, if you don't have believing children in your home, it's not a sign of good leadership. We're to raise the child in the way should they go, and when they're not, when they're grown up, they will not depart from it. It's a principle, not a promise. Children should not be wild. Uh, Literally, the word here is debauchery should not be reckless, wasteful, thoughtless, rash. 
This idea that love with luxury, consumed with self. Uh, the prodigal son comes to mind here. In fact, the, the, the word in Greek is related to prodigal. And no, prodigal means, uh, prodigal doesn't mean what everyone thinks it means. Prodigal means luxurious. And the prodigal son was one who chased after the luxury of the world. And so our children are not to be like that, not be wild. Not to be diso- the children are not to be disobedient or rebellious, they're to be respectful. There's a picture of, of, a, of a child that's out of control, a youth that's out of control. Um, personally, I'm, I'm a little concerned because in the Rice household, we have a, a one-year-old that is uh, a little out of control. He has learned to uh, take his diaper off. So pray for us. This morning he uh, took his diaper off and he left a present at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> so <laughs> thankfully no one slipped. Uh, not disobedient. Hopefully that's not a quali- disqualifying, fac- disqualifying factor in the Rice household. Um, we will work to, we will work as responsible parents to help him walk through this phase. We're not gonna leave him there. But no good leader, no good parent would. It brings the issue, can singles be elders? Talk a lot about marriage here, talk a lot about family life. Can singles be elders? Well, think about this. Who's writing this letter? The Apostle Paul. Was the Apostle Paul married? No, he was not. Not only that, but he boasted about his singleness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that he was single, he's able to endure persecution without having to worry about his family dying. And so he's single focused on the Lord. Not a care in the world except to please God. And so singles can be wonderful elders. Much appreciated elders. I was in singles ministry for 10 years and I loved it. I I would spend often 20, 30 hours a week on top of my job serving the church in singles ministry. I loved it. And that, that the singles were a family, and it was awesome and so appreciated. So we talk a lot about marriage. If someone is married, this is what their family should look like. If they have children, this is what the children should look like. If they're not married or they don't have children, uh, do, are they focused on the Lord? Is their heart right? What they do in their own privacy? So how is your family life? What kind of example are you setting for the children in your home? Or by the way you live in your home, how are your friends, what kind of example are you setting for your friends? Uh, Children are a wonderful mirror, aren't they? They are. They look like us physically. But so often, they they do just what we do. Now, rest assured, I'm not taking my diaper off I walk around the house. There's some things of depravity that they learn on their own. But so often... They, uh, they take just after us. And so are we exhibiting the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Are we demonstrating a heart of love? Do we have joy in our hearts? Do we have peace, especially when things are difficult? Do we have patience with them? Are we kind towards them? Are we good towards them, faithful, in gentleness and self-control? Are we displaying these things in our own home? It's really important to look at the example of what a person looks like in the privacy of their own home. Are we we prioritizing their spiritual well-being? Are we we loving our spouse as well? And then how are they responding? Other than occasional mental health behavioral issues, the children will imitate the parents. And they see this side of us that we don't often see in church or work or in public. They know the real you. Look at the children and we'll, we'll see the, the leadership on the whole of the adult. Leaders in God's house must lead their own house well. They must set an example of godly Christian living in the privacy of their own home before being entrusted with ministry in public. It's critically important that anyone in leadership in church, their very first ministry is their home. Critically important. So many times when you see min, uh, ministers or church leaders fail in public, it's because they allow things to slip in their own family life. And it, it's, it's a, I've seen a lot happen in the church. In fact, I'll never forget the time that I, I uh, worked for a pastor church in the, in the thousands. Everyone was, was a wonderful preacher. Everyone really respected and, and trusted and appreciated him. But his four sons all left the faith. He's working 78 hours a week. He's not spending time in the home. And, and God forbid that happened to me or anyone on staff or in leadership here. Must prioritize ministry in the home first. And out of that, we get to love 
others. I think the, that my capacity for serving this church is proportional to the capacity of, of, of my service to Camila in the home. And if I'm not loving and serving and treasuring her well, anything I'm doing here is empty. And so it's so important that we minister and, and focus on the family first. Look at that example in the, of the home. Then we get into the attributes of an elder. Uh, first, we look at what to avoid in a good a leader. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, and not pursuing dishonest gain. These are characteristics to avoid. Let's walk through these. First is an elder should not be overbearing. Uh, this would be uh, someone who is stubborn, who's arrogant, who is consumed with self, uh, someone who is close-minded to the, feeling, the feelings and ideas of others. This, this is, a, this is a, a, a poisonous leader. Church leadership is a team effort, and we've got to be listening to one another, and we just can't shut people down. We need to be open to new ideas and new thoughts and opinions. And so at least to entertain and to listen. The leader should not be quick-tempered, uh, not be easily angered, not just be kind of generally angry. Or someone, You know the people that are living with a chip on their shoulder? They've been disrespected. They've got wounds that they're carrying, hurts that they're carrying from the past, and carrying a chip on a shoulder, just waiting for someone to knock it off. Um, people that are quick-tempered are emotionally unstable and often aggressive towards others. You know, there's always reasons to be angry. <laughs> Amen? There's always reasons to be angry, to feel slighted. We must master those feelings and surrender them to the Lord and find healing and peace. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God, in James 1.20. There is a righteous anger. It's okay to be righteously angry from time to time, but this should not be something that characterizes our lives, a quick-temperedness. Elders are not to be given to drunkenness, uh, literally not remaining long beside his wine. Not addicted to or controlled by alcohol or any other substance. And drinking in moderation is okay. Jesus did it. If Jesus did it, then it's not a sin. But nothing good ever comes from being drunk. To be reckless, to be out of control, to not be in possession of yourself. And so much crime and so much atrocities is committed because people are not in control of their bodies. They become drunk or high or whatever it may be. It's very important that elders not be given to drunkenness. They must not be violent, uh, literally not a striker. Not violent, not a bully, not quarrelsome, not physically or verbally threatening to other people. Church leaders are not to be picking fights with others. A leader brings unity, not division. A leader will often also defer to others, laying down their own rights to honor one another, not to be violent with others, lifting up, not tearing down. And good leaders do not pursue dishonest gain, not greedy for shameful gain, not a lover of money, do not lack a commitment to what is right. I think uh, that, that greed, that, that desire for money, and for power, for things can be so dangerous, will not cut corners for, for, for financial gain. So these are things that, you want to, that, we, that must not be present as defining characteristics of a good leader. But here you find what attributes to look for in a leader. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Let's examine these words here. The very first word is it should be hospitable. It's a great word. And the Greek here is uh, philozenon. Um, you might be familiar, uh, philo is love of or affection for. And Xenon is stranger. And so literally hosp hospitality is a, to be a lover of strangers. It's to show kindness and warmth and friendship to those that you don't know. To have an open door policy to welcome people into your world and, and love them even if you don't know them. And that's a great definition, that's a great picture of grace, isn't it? That we show grace and affection towards those who we don't even know. And it's interesting, this is the very first qualification on the list to be hospitable. 
And how can, we, how can we share the gospel or the love of Christ if our front door is always locked? And so it's really important that we be open and embracing the stranger and love them. It should also be a lover what is good. Again, we've got uh, the philo prefix, agathos, which is good, to be affectionate towards what is good. To be devoted to God, his creation, and all his ways. It's more than just simply avoiding evil, but to love what is good. And maybe this is taking it so far, but I think to appreciate what God has made. And so if you appreciate a good cup of coffee, coffee's good. Maybe you're a lover of what's good there. That's probably taking it too far. But, but to love what is good, what God has created that we can enjoy in, in moderation. Should be self-controlled, prudent, thoughtful, Showing good sense. Must be able to lead self before you can lead others. I think as you look at this idea of being self-controlled, that you're not given to the distractions. Able to focus and accomplish the important tasks at hand. To be self-controlled. To be focused on what's important. An elder should be upright. Someone who is righteous, just, fair, innocent of charges. Uh, this is a commitment to doing what is right in every circumstance, no matter what's at stake. A leader should be holy. Now, holy literally means set apart. It means different. A leader should be different from this world. That, that our goal is not to please ourselves, but to please God. That, and, and that we're set apart for God. Uh, this is this that we are that our lives we view our lives as sacred and we want to be pure because we represent God. Uh, someone who's holy is somebody who's committed wholeheartedly to live for the Lord and serve Him alone. And the leader should be disciplined to be a master of oneself. It's the ability to remain steadfast in the face of temptation and persistent in doing good. This is very similar to self-control, but the way I look at this uh, is specifically in regards to danger. You think about it in the war, when you've got a bunch of soldiers that are lined up, and, and they're going to try to defend, uh, they're going to try to defend a place from the enemy, and the discipline is to wait and to follow the instructions of the superior officer to make sure you all fire at the same time at the same targets. And if one person runs in the face of danger, that hurts everyone else, and it'll probably cause panic, and people will flee. Leaders must stand firm in the faith, refusing to buck or to leave or to quit. Persist in what's doing good in the face of danger. Now you look at this list of attributes. It's, it's a pretty intimidating list. But as, as you think about it, are there any that are strengths for you? And it's, it's, it's okay to look at this and say, you know, I'm doing all right in this area. I'm, I'm maybe I'm a little weak in, in this area. Which of these are weaknesses for you? Are there any areas that would disqualify you from being a leader? I think about these things. Now, I, I think about um, um, maybe a strength for me is I look at the list, and I look, especially look at the, the don't do this list, and I feel pretty, I feel pretty good about that. Um, I don't think I'm really, I, don't, I hope none of those are descriptive of me, uh, but I think I'm doing all right there. But when I, look at the, when I look at the weaknesses, I think, you know, looking at the list of things that you ought to be, there's lots of room to grow. And so my prayer for, for myself would be God would continue to give me strength uh, to, to face off against the temptations, but that he would, he, there's so much room for me to grow. I want to I become more hospitable. I want to become more a lover of good and holy and pure and those things. And so just think about yourself. Are there any areas of weakness? What's wonderful is that we have a forgiving God. And so if, if you fall short in one of these areas, just simply letting the Lord know and asking for forgiveness and finding that. I understand it's not our own willpower that accomplishes these things. It's the Holy Spirit alive and at work in us, something supernatural. That's wonderful. Godly servant leaders must be men and women of character. Our lives should demonstrate that we love the Lord with all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength. And lastly, we get the doctrine. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught 
so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refuse those who oppose it. And so in conclusion, the elder must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. So what is the trustworthy message? Simply put, it's God's word for us. And this is the inspired word of God. And it's, it's wonderful. And yet we can read God's word all day long and walk away and have different ideas on what it says or what it means. And so we must develop a doctrine. A shared set of beliefs held by a group is how the dictionary defines it. And so, and so what, do we believe the, what do we believe the main points of the Bible are that we hold to? And we must hold firmly to these. I like the, I like the, the fact that, that Paul says we must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. Not just kind of hold it and when things get difficult you let go. But you hold to the message of the gospel in every circumstance. It means you hold to the message of the gospel when you have a child that is dying. You hold to the message of the, of the gospel when your job is in chaos, when your world is in chaos, when your friends are sick, when your world is crumbling down. We hold firmly to the gospel. Hold firmly to the scriptures. It's everything to us. It's life to us. When you're talking about doctrine, Again, we're part of the EFCA. What are the things that we need to hold to specifically? Well, here's, here's a list of our 10 essentials. And each one of these is just so amazing. I'm gonna preach on this sometime next year and walk through so we have an understanding of what it means, what they mean. But just thinking about these, we, we view God the creator of all things, existed before time, and three members, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, we know who we're worshiping and who we're praying to. We believe that, that God preserved for us instructions. And, and his great love for us, he, he gave us his word, his message to us in the Bible is trustworthy and pure. We believe that in the human condition that we all fall short of God's perfect standard, that all of us have broken the Ten Commandments at some point, and that the human heart tends to do what is evil, and that we do not deserve to be with our perfect, amazing Heavenly Father. But because of what the Bible says, we have the message of Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, the perfect, sinless Son of God. And that he came and, and died on the cross for us to pay the, the penalty for all of our sins. And for all those who put our faith and trust in him, he does not leave us alone, but he said in, in the book of John, he left us a comforter, an advocate, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us. And that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that uh, the church are all those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. And the church is, is meeting right now throughout churches all over this nation and the world. And the church has existed throughout all time. And so think about hundreds of years ago, there are saints who did the exact same things that we're doing right now. That the one church who, who belonged to God, the bride of Christ. And that we as, as members of the church are responsible to live as models of Christ. That we live to follow him to live for him, to look like him. And that's what Christian means, to belong to Christ or to look like Christ. And we've got a responsibility. And that we, we look forward to the day that Christ will return and set every wrong right and establish his kingdom in heaven. And we're gonna be part of that. And we have an important response, a choice to make. Will we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ or will we put our faith in ourselves or some other thing? And the destiny for doing that is eternal judgment. And this is our doctrine. You see how important this is when you go through difficult times? Each one of these, critically important on a daily basis. Importance of doctrine is not just for personal edification, and, and it's great. But for the leader, the leader must encourage others by sound doctrine to share it with others, to teach others, and also to refute those who oppose sound doctrine. You think about how the gospel is being opposed today as people uh, are very self-reliant. They think that they can be good enough to deserve God. They're focused on themselves or focused on the luxuries of the world. They're blasphemous, feeling like they, they are God or there is no God. 
are just being very self-centered, and we need to address that, and those that stand in opposition to sound doctrine, particularly those within the church. Godly leaders must have a clear understanding of what they believe and why they believe it. Biblical illiteracy today is a direct result of unqualified leaders in our homes and in our churches. Leadership is critically important in ourselves and in the church. And uh, you notice I used the word he a whole lot this morning. Um, it's, it's like I, I want I to teach on this for, f- for a few reasons. One is all of us are leaders to some degree. All of us have influence. What kind of influencers are we going to be? It doesn't matter how old you are or your gender. Um, and, then, and then you want to know what good leadership looks like. And this gives a good picture of what good leadership is. And then you look, here Paul is specifically setting in charge male leadership on the island of Crete. Every time there are elders in the Bible, they are always male. And so if we are 100% committed to, to God and God's word, I'm going to err on that side. There are many wonderful, qualified women leaders, but at least here, elders always male. So that kind of, that's what we do as well. We, we only have male uh, elders at the church. And this is what they should look like. Qualified family life, men of great character, and men who understand sound doctrine. As a challenge for wherever you are this morning, would, en- would encourage you a couple things. Uh, one is to consider membership at Christ Community Church and enlist and in service here. Um, I believe membership is really important. You know, membership is, is ultimately you're allowing us to uh, look at, examine your life examine your beliefs and make sure that that they are in line with our beliefs, that we're all on the same page when it comes to doctrine. Uh, Membership also is, it brings accountability that we at this church, we practice church discipline, which means that if we see someone, and I I don't know anyone that's done this, but if we were to see somebody who who is going out and getting drunk every night, that we would have a conversation with them towards restoration and reconciliation, that we would go after them and love them and help them intervene. So they don't just go back this, they don't just don't go out down this terrible road. You've got people that love you and look out for you, even when, you have, even when they have to protect you from yourself. We all need accountability. We all need people that know us. And, and that's one reason why church membership is important, is that mutual accountability. And, and being able to, to see what their family life is and to, be, to know others and be known. And so membership is important. And so would you consider that? Would you pray about that? And then, and then think, on, on your outline, I have a heart to serve, and then you've got blank. Is there an area where you'd like to lead? Uh, maybe you've got a heart for serving children or a heart for, uh, for doing technology. We always need help. We need help to sing. We need help to greet. There's always area. We need help to, to guard and protect our congregation, make sure that we're safe. We do have a, a, a safety team. And so if, if you've got a heart to serve, think about that. Think about leading in a particular area. Having, if you're not a member, you'd like to, to consider membership, uh, you can just simply go to ChristCCOcala.com slash join, and it's also in the, in the bulletin. And uh, it's a process where you, you watch some videos. There's two and a half hours of videos, mostly of me talking. I apologize <laughs> if you get sick of me. Uh, but, uh, but there's five videos that you watch to make sure we're in, we're in line with one another doctrinally. And then you fill out an application, just kind of talk about who you are and your, your belief in Christ and when you became a believer. Uh, then you'll have a, a one-on-one conversation with me, an interview with the elders, and then we'll affirm you as our congregation. And so there's a few steps there, um, but it's really important. That's membership. We are all called to leadership in the church. And leadership is an act of servanthood. It's an act of love. And may God give us households uh, that are full of his love and his joy and of Christ. And we, may we display, may we look like Christ and display his attributes in our lives and hold firmly to his doctrine. We're gonna talk about an area of doctrine here in just a moment as we take communion. Essentially, that's what that is. We've got the two elements. You've got the, the bread. We believe that, that Jesus Christ came and, and lived a sinless life for us and he died on the cross for us and his his life is everything to us. His life is our life. And we look at the, the, the cup. We take the cup. 
And we look at the blood that he shed on the cross, and in him, not only do we have life, but we also have forgiveness and reconciliation and peace with God the Father through Christ the Son. We practice open communion here at Christ Community Church, which means that if you've professed faith in Christ, please come, your brother or sister, you're welcome to take communion with us. Now to do that, I'm gonna take the, the lids off these and just encourage you to quietly, as we consider the, as we consider the work of Christ on the cross for us, just encourage you to be, be, be prayerful in your, in your heart and in your, in your mind. And as we talked about the character attributes, if there's anything you need to confess before the Lord, now's a good time to do that, to make sure that you're right with the Lord. And so uh, the worship team's gonna play in the background and, and come on up, grab the elements, and then go back to your seat, and we will take them together in a moment. Jesus on the night that he was betrayed he took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you and do this in remembrance of me same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in you. We rejoice in the privilege that we have to be called your children, that you love us. In spite of our sins, in spite of our failures, Lord, you are a God who's full of grace and mercy and love, and that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, 
wiping out all of our sin. We may stand before you pure and faultless, not because of what we have done, but because of your great love for us. What a wonderful, great, and amazing God that you are, a wonderful Father. Lord, we have quite a, a work, quite a labor in front of us, Lord, and I pray that you would give us passion to advance your kingdom and that as we look around us, that you'd give us a heart to serve, a heart to lead, and to love those around us. Pray that in our homes, we, your love would be reflected in how we relate to our spouses and our children if they're in the home. Places of peace and joy that reflect your goodness. And as we walk around and people know who we are and see us, Lord, that we would reflect your character in our attributes. That they would see us, we would not bring you shame, but we would act in such a manner to not bring you, to not bring you shame, but to bring you glory. We would be blameless before you. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us, help us to understand your word and we may teach and encourage others with it and stand up against falsehoods, Lord. And pray for strong leaders in this church. Pray for strong leaders in churches across the world and in our communities that we would, that we would uh, be those who honor you, that live for you as we worship you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.